Recently, over on Hank Green's new channel, sort of new channel, Journey to the Microcosmos, he asked the question, why are desmids symmetrical? What evolutionary advantage does symmetry give to these little single-celled algae? Today I'm going to argue that there is no evolutionary advantage for symmetry in desmids. Just like there's no evolutionary advantage for the symmetry in a snowflake. Instead, their symmetry is what Stephen Jay Gould called a spandrel. It is a consequence of their growth and development. It's not selected for, it's just a consequence of growth and development. Now, I would say that these spikes on desmids probably do have an evolutionary explanation. You know, maybe they make it harder to swallow if some other critter wants to eat one of these. The grooves, the folds in the desmid cells, I think that these also serve probably an evolutionary function. They make the cell more rigid and sturdy. But the symmetry of desmids themselves, here I will argue that's just a consequence of development. An evolutionary spandrel. Let me explain. You are watching Science Stated Casually with John Perry, the number one place on the internet to listen to John, the science educator, that's me, ramble aimlessly about the stuff he's been thinking about. Today I want to share with you something that I've been thinking about a lot lately, and that is, how is it that genes interact with the environment? And for a gene, by the way, the cell is the environment, its most immediate environment, and then the environment outside the cell is the extended environment. How is it that a gene interacts with its environment to produce the phenotype of a cell, and eventually the phenotype of an organism? That's a really interesting question. I've actually, I've been thinking about this so much lately that I even broke down and bought a textbook on it, which I'll be going through, uh, Mechanisms of Morphogenesis. But I've started out my in-depth exploration of this by just focusing on this genus right here. This is Microsterius, and the reason I'm interested in Microsterius is that what, what you're looking at is a single cell. This is not a multi-celled organism. It's a single-celled algal organism, and it has semicells, so each half of the cell is symmetrical, but it has a really neat, intricate phenotype. It's got all these spikes, and it's got these grooves and divots on it. Really, really cool cell. How do genes interact with the environment to produce these structures? So I've been thinking about this question for several months, and then I found on Hank Green's new channel, Microcosmos, I don't know if you've seen this yet, this is where he describes things under a microscope. Amazing channel, absolutely stunning photography in there. And he asked this question. Desmids aren't unique in having some kind of symmetry. We see symmetry all across nature, to the extent where asymmetry might reveal more about how an organism works than symmetry does. But this kind of mirrored semi-cell arrangement is particularly striking to look at and to consider, which leads naturally to the question, why? We haven't yet dug up any scientific literature that can explain what advantage this symmetry might provide. Though, of course, we might also be seeking the simplicity of easy evolutionary answers when reality is more complex. But if you do have an answer, or even just a guess, let us know, because at the moment, we don't have any. I can't give you an evolutionary answer to this. I can't tell you what advantage the symmetry gives this organism, what evolutionary advantage it gives it, but I can tell you why these things are symmetrical. And the answer comes from watching how they reproduce. This video is from 2016. It's the Nikon Small World in Motion competition. This particular clip was submitted by Wim Van Egmond. I'm sorry, Wim, if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. In this, we see that the cell's symmetry is simply a consequence of how it reproduces. The thing splits in two, and then the two halves grow new halves. And because those new halves grow with the same genes and under the same conditions that the adults, the adult halves grew under, the parental halves grew under, you have symmetry. The symmetry is just a consequence of growing under the same conditions 
as the parental half of the cell grew. That's it. <laughs> it. It's so simple that it's not satisfying, right? But there's something else that's really interesting about this video. This video also helps us answer questions about how genes interact with our environment to produce phenotype. Because look at what's happening as this cell grows. One of the questions that you might be asking is, how is it that this cell decides where these dimples will form? These dimples, of course, end up becoming the grooves that form the branches and eventually the branches and the spikes that we see in the adult cell. How is this cell making that decision? How does it decide where to form a dimple that will end up producing a branch and then spikes? Here in this video, we can see quite clearly that this is just a simple physical consequence of tension forming as the cell grows. Let me explain. So here I got a little drawing of our organism and it's, it's in growth stage. It's already, there's already been cell division. So the nucleus is already split between these two halves and we've got growth on this little sucker right here. This thing is growing and the way that the membrane grows in the cell wall, they grow together because you've got vesicles that have uh, cell wall parts in them that are coming up, merging with the cell membrane, spitting that out to grow the cell wall. So you have this constant bubbling up of things from inside the cell and adding to the cell wall and the cell membrane. And so you get, basically you get constant growth at each point of the cell wall. So just to draw that out here, you've got at each point along this wall, you've got growth going from the left and to the right, left and to the right. And that's, that's true everywhere, except, except at this point right here and this point right here, we can't grow in both ways because we're, we're up against a nice rigid wall, the, the adult wall. So that means that right down here, we can only grow upwards. We also have a similar thing happening up here, but to a lesser extent, because where this, where these two cells are attached, we have a, a little bit of an anchor point. So let's just, let's just call all of these anchor points. And at an anchor point, you can't grow both ways. You can only grow one way. And nah, there's actually kind of a bunch of little anchor points up here because the cells are stuck together. And so there's not much growth happening here. It's very slow. They're stuck together. There's pressure stopping the expansion, but you do have growth outward. So in the middle, you have expansion to the left and to the right, and that's bumping up against the expansion. It's only going in one direction from each anchor point. That causes tension to build up in this system. I'm gonna illustrate that tension with this red little gradient here. So we've got tension forming there. And at the same time that that tension is forming, so growth is gonna be slower here than everywhere else because things are packed more tightly together. So we're actually getting the formation of a new anchor point. It's slowly forming, a, a point where there cannot be growth, in this case, because of physical pressure. Add that to the fact that we have water pressure outside this, atmospheric pressure, whatever you wanna call it, that's pointing inward. So when you have tension like this, and you, you could either have it bulge outward, so it, it could either end up bulging outward like that, or it could end up collapsing in and pushing inward. Well, because we have pressure from the outside pushing in, this little pressure point in the membrane and the cell wall is going to result in a collapse. It's going to result in the formation of a dimple. This point, we have what is essentially a new anchor point. We've got a new anchor point right there. As things continue to grow, we have a new point that's going to form tension right around here. So I'm gonna show that again with a gradient. That starts to form there. And then once that pressure gets high enough, it will also collapse and form the next. We will also see a dimple forming up here that I forgot to draw. 
So that will end up looking like this and so on. All of that can be figured out by watching that little film. Of course, actual scientists have done actual research on this as well. Here's a really cool paper on this that models the growth. It's called algal morphogenesis. And <laughs> it's funny, you know, I've, I've read a lot of these papers. And this paper in particular is really neat in that they actually get a model, a mathematical model, to simulate the growth. But I think that they overcomplicate it. Their model assumes that there's this chemical interplay there's some sort of morphogenic molecule that's slowing down growth in certain spots and accelerating growth in other spots. And I think that you can just do all that simply by paying attention to the physical pressure that's exerted on this system as it expands under water pressure, under atmospheric pressure. I think that's all you need. These guys are overcomplicating it, but their models are really nice. Take a look at this paper if, you, if you're interested. I also want to point out that the, the funny little shapes on the tops of these things, those have those are formed because one cell is pushing on the other cell as it grows. That's why you have that central shaft in all of these different organisms. That central shaft is formed because there's more pressure on that area and it can't grow as fast as the other areas because it's busy, you know, pushing off the other cell as it grows. So here we've seen a bunch of physical processes that are determining the shape of this cell. But I do want to point out that genes are controlling this, but they're controlling it indirectly. The stickiness of the outside of the membrane, that the stickiness of the two cells to each other as the cells are splitting apart, that is determined by genes that code for the proteins that are on the outside of this cell. And mutations in those genes can change how sticky that cell is, and that will change how much pressure there is on it as it grows, and that's going to change how many spikes there are, how many grooves there are, and so on. So this is a really awesome interplay between genes and environment that determine that phenotype. I hope you all enjoyed learning this with me or thinking about this with me. There might be lots of things that I got wrong in this. I mean, this is really just me looking at the cell and trying to figure out how it works, and then looking at various papers and seeing what other people have said. So, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to have people argue with me about this in the comments. We'll think about this together. Stay curious, everyone.